Welcome to this afternoon's session. Um, my name's EJ Monagulland. I am the um, director of the Oxford Martin Programme on the Illegal Wildlife Trade and one of the members of the organising committee. Um, and I'm really excited to have um, assembled a very dynamic, diverse uh, group of people to talk about the kind of core thing that we're discussing here today, which is about how do you get evidence from research into action. And this panel, uh, just to give a little uh, plug, this panel uh, was inspired by this briefing note, which you'll find online, which uh, was written by a group of people uh, from the organising committee and other people as well, about how we think the evidence could be got into action. But they're, they're not required to speak from this document. <laughs> um, so I'm going to let them introduce themselves, and then I hope we can have a really uh, dynamic discussion. So we'll start with Ed Edson. Uh, thank you, EJ. Um, my name is Edson Gandiwa. Uh, I am a dean of, of, of the School of Wildlife, Ecology and Conservation from Chinua University of Technology in Zimbabwe. Uh, a brief of my background, I started off as a wildlife ecologist uh, with the Zimbabwe Wildlife Authority, that's the Zimbabwe Parks and Wildlife Management Authority. So I was for 10 years based in Gwenaresho National Park, uh, really you know, conducting much uh, applied research. And then uh, for the past five years, I'm now based at Chinua University of Technology. So basically my research uh, trail, I started off more as a natural you know, scientist, uh, more on the wildlife ecology research. And nowadays I focus much on the human wildlife interface. So issues of uh, illegal wildlife trade you know, comes in that uh, borderline. Particularly for, for this uh, discussion, uh, what I think are some of the key uh, elements uh, to do with evidence uh, is to do with applied research, uh, particularly from my background where you, specific uh, answers were needed and uh, their applied research actually you know, was very, very critical uh, using uh, very robust uh, methods. This were very essential, particularly when you want to really tackle uh, key issues and then uh, those feed into an adaptive uh, management framework. Uh, the second issue which I, I feel uh, is critical, particularly when you interact with policymakers, is the issue of uh, the science diplomacy. Because at times wh what we really publish uh, may be very technical, uh, the issues of how we now synthesize that and bring uh, the key uh, elements, the key highlights uh, to policymakers is very, very you know, essential. And then the last uh, item I'll raise here, uh, which is very critical even from my perspective when you come from Zimbabwe. There are some areas where real uh, science uh, perhaps, you know, applied research is not occurring uh, or the monitoring is not there. So the issue of how we integrate uh, local ecological knowledge or traditional knowledge systems uh, into our decision-making framework, that one is very, very essential. And how that feeds uh, even in the aspect of illegal wildlife trade is very key. Thank you very much. Um, I'm Scott Robertson. I work for the Wildlife Conservation Society, uh, overseeing all of our work on counter wildlife trafficking uh, across Asia. Um, you know, a lot of what we face is, is low political will, commitment, interest, whatever, whatever word addresses that uh, uh, challenge for us. Um, and a lot of what we're trying to do is to build kind of a, an enabling environment through policy where governments will start to take more action uh, against wildlife trafficking networks. And so, you know, a lot of our work is trying to find that evidence and the data that is compelling enough that will allow a government to take action. That's often not about animals, that's often about other areas uh, that aren't our skill sets. Rule of law, uh, might be about border security, it might be about uh, public health. Um, and so uh, it's finding other people that can do those types of research and have credibility to speak about that. And I have two kind of observations um, about this issue of evidence and where some of our problems might be. You know, I've just last week, as quite a lot of people here, were at Sochi and CITES Standing Committee, and it's always interesting to see a big <coughs> multilateral forum, probably the biggest, most important one on, on wildlife trafficking, you know, be so driven by subjective feelings of different animals and which animals get huge attention and the, fill the working groups and other animals which, you know, something like tortoises and freshwater turtles that are many species far more endangered than the, you know, the elephants and rhinos. They are of a greater value in terms of economic value than, than things like rhino horn and barely on the agenda. Um, and the other thing I'd say is one of our challenges is we're in crisis mode, and so we are very quick sometimes to be very reactionary and have this sense of urgency about something. I think you take the example of uh, what's happening or what might be happening with the Jaguar, and there's a sense of 
we know enough to just go out there and start doing things. We must react to this terrible, you know, set of indications that suggest that there is increased poaching of jaguars and it's commercially driven and there's, you know, Asian interests. And it's the balance of us reacting too soon on something that we don't know enough about or reacting too late as has often been the case. And I think we need to kind of, there's trade-offs that we probably need to uh, understand a bit better. Thank you. Um, I'm Rosaline Duffy. I'm a professor of international politics at the University of Sheffield. Um, and I'm also the lead on the Biosec project, which is examining the intersections between the security sector um, and conservation. And there are kind of three areas, I think, to think about in terms of evidence and policy. And the first is, you know, about evidence base. There are teams of researchers um, in universities and other research institutes that have a wealth of knowledge, but we're not always the first port of call for policy makers. And um, we have a lot to um, offer. But the second thing that I want to say about evidence is, you know, to really think and reflect about what constitutes evidence. You know, uh, figures, data, graphs, maps, machine learning, all of those are really important. But um, we also need to um, ensure that we don't overlook the really powerful individual counts of people's experiences and their knowledge of what's happening in illegal wildlife trade and then also how conservation strategies to tackle it um, affect their everyday lives. Um, I think those um, stories are also important because they link in with growing calls to de decolonise our knowledge base and think about um, who we need to bring in into the conversation. Um, and as part of that, I think sharing knowledge is really important. I think one of the things that's always struck me about the illegal wildlife trade is there are so many different organisations, international organisations, law enforcement organisations, all of which hold really important information, but we may not be so great at sharing it. And in that sense, we may reinvent the wheel over and over and over again, and there can be an over-focus on certain areas and a lack of interest um, in others. And I think that's particularly challenging if... Um, NGOs um, hold uh, politically sensitive intelligence um, or criminal intelligence um, because uh, they may not be trained, their staff may not be trained on how to uh, store and share that safely without jeopardising participants. And so the final thing I wanted to say was about questions of diversity and ability to access uh, platforms like this. Um, I think um, we need to be aware for, of the need for a diversity um, of voices and I think um, our, our event plus the London conference can be an example of that. If we rely on networks and invitations then all we do is reproduce the same conversation with the same people at every meeting and we don't have, if we haven't come up with the solutions now then we might not come up with it in the future if we all just keep talking to each other. So I think we need to think about um, a diversity of voices and on top of that we've thought carefully about you know, who we might invite in and who we give platforms to. Um, but even if those people are able to come and to speak, sometimes they're prevented by visa restrictions or their visa is denied at the very last minute. And that also doesn't help us have that diverse and open conversation that we need. Um, my name is uh, Lin Xu from Trev China. Um, I started to be engaged in uh, IWT research uh, from 2006, focusing on the illegal uh, trade in ivory, uh, rhino horn, tiger, and other endangered species products. Today, I would like to share you uh, an example uh, how uh, our research in China um, to um, influence the uh, policy making. Um, as you know, 10 years ago, um, uh, the uh, both the Chinese government as well the um, uh, and the uh, uh, online companies they paid very uh, little attention to the uh, illegal wildlife trade online. Uh, from that time, we started our uh, regular mon uh, market monitoring in the online platform. Every month, we collected the information and uh, we shared, uh, timely shared the information with the, uh, both uh, uh, enforcement agencies and uh, the uh, <coughs> online company, the uh, security staff, to help them to. Uh, delete or prevent the illegal wildlife trade online. So uh, at the same time, we also organize the um, like enforcement training for government officers and the online companies. Um, and uh, uh, and uh, in the 
in 2016, finally, uh, the Chinese government, uh, they changed some uh, uh, policy relevant to uh, wildlife subcrime. They increased two new articles in the new China's uh, wildlife animal protection law. So uh, all the, um, the advertising, illegal wildlife uh, advertising, uh, products is not is forbidden uh, in the online uh, platforms and all the online platforms are not allowed to provide any service uh, to such such, uh, such a crime yeah so there's a very um, inf uh, significant uh, progress in China uh, which is uh, delivered by the Chinese government and uh, also for the online companies uh, last year we um, initiated uh, by the uh, three uh, big uh, big Chinese online companies such as uh, Tencent uh, Alibaba and uh, and Baidu um, the uh, China's uh, alliance against wildlife sub was established and uh, uh, this year in March uh, all the members of this alliance they joined the global coalition to end wildlife trafficking online in, in US so all the um, all the uh, the uh, global coalition member they committed to uh, reduce the number of illegal wildlife advertisement in their platform by uh, seven, uh, uh, 80 percent by 2020. So, um, so from uh, this example, we can we can see um, if we can uh, conduct our research, you know, for a longer time, and we can if we can use this this research uh, in the right way to lobby with the Chinese government or the other government, we can uh, expect to uh, get the very significant achievement on the uh, policy making. So thank you to the panelists for um, these opening remarks. And now, um, does anyone have any questions or observations that they'd like? Okay, so, oh, oh there's one there, yeah. Can you just, can you introduce yourself um, before you start your question? Thank you, my name is I am from Nigeria. I work for an NGO called Initiative for Education and Development. Um, it would be interesting to learn more from um, India, how you were able to work, particularly for us in Nigeria, um, it's difficult to actually engage the uh, policy makers in terms of lawmaking and enforcing some of these. So if you could explain further, how were you able to get to the policy makers so that they accepted um, the enforcement and the change in rules. Thank you. So I think uh, we can perhaps ask um, Edson to start with that. Uh, thank you, uh, EJ, and thank you for the question. Perhaps uh, I will give uh, the perspective uh, from, from my own experience uh, with the Zimbabwean uh, case. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, you know, earlier, you know, working with uh, the Wildlife Authority, uh, I think one thing which was, which was important, and even now, uh, when we contribute uh, to policy making, we have just... Uh, uh, finished the campfire review or the communal areas management uh, program uh, for indigenous resources review and I was part of the team that was working there. So ideally I think the, the issue of uh, you know, the evidence uh, in terms of hard science or even uh, natural sciences, social sciences coming into play, uh, the policy makers want to see uh, real uh, you know, research results uh, that involves in our perspective of the communal areas management program uh, for indigenous resources campfire. It was more to say if you talked to the uh, people, so the evidence has to be there. Uh, and also, uh, I think the issue which we raised in the morning uh, about the credibility uh, of perhaps you know, those that are involved in that research and also uh, the, the, the depth of the research, uh, it's, it's something that you, know, you have to bring into, uh, into the picture yeah, as you uh, develop some of the policies or even recommendations uh, that you know, government may, may take into consideration. Ling, do you want to say something? Yeah. Um, all the uh, our work in China, for example, um, I the conducted, um, I mean, the building on the long um, 
collaboration with the uh, enforcement agencies. So we need to uh, uh, trust each other first. Otherwise, uh, even we submit our like uh, illegal wildlife trade information to them, they you know they just uh, put it maybe just on their table, no any follow up. Yeah, but uh, um, so currently uh, it, it should be the um, the common problem for uh, for those uh, other NGO who hasn't who haven't uh, had the uh, registered office in, in China, because uh, maybe you just uh, come to China, then uh, say hello to the government officer, and you said, okay, I will provide like the intelligence to you. But uh, even at that time, the government said, okay, yeah, welcome. But actually, there's no any follow-up. So uh, I do think uh, if we want to uh, want to make uh, some changes, particularly in the uh, policy aspects, we have to establish the very long-term collaboration with the uh, relevant government authorities. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's just a quick point, but I think it's an important one about law enforcement. Um, that it, it, the sort of focus on law enforcement assumes that the law is neutral and that it's to be upheld and that the interests of the state are in line with the interests of its citizenry. And I think in lots of places around the world, that's not the case. So, you know, what do we do if the law actually is unjust, if it's a colonial import, and if the state's interests are actually inimical to the interests of people on the ground? I think sometimes that's forgotten in the debate about how to make law enforcement more effective. Um, I mean, just to your question of like, you know, it's hard to engage policymakers. That's definitely the case in, in many countries <laughs> where we work. And I think um, I've definitely found it's about dipping into the kind of the toolkit from the lobbying and advocacy type people, which obviously uh, can be a dirty word to some scientists, but it's, it's honestly quite important. Um, we may never have the credibility to convene a set of policymakers, but it's about identifying who does, what would convene them, what are the issues they're interested in, who's the right person to convey a message. Uh, there's plenty of times that we've had people in a room because they wanted to meet a certain individual who they thought was gonna speak to them about a certain issue, and they do, but then they will also be he hearing about you know, our issues, but it's how you present that issue. But I would encourage you to you know, look and meet up with other people working in Nigeria that, that are working on other <laughs> lobbying and advocacy issues and, and see how they're approaching it. Okay, next question. Someone in the middle there. Um, Jim Karani, uh, Wildlife Direct, Kenya. Um, from time to time, I find myself doing research which stumbles upon things government officials don't like. Um, and uh, it's very easy for you to say, go meet him, talk to him, might open the door for you. Many of these government officials are in bed with the wildlife traffickers. Many of them are wildlife traffickers. Um, if you look for illegal wildlife trade or illegal wildlife trafficking, chances are you'll stumble on drugs guns, human trafficking. So my only question is, do you find yourself from time to time having to dumb down your research so that it's accepted as a policy document? And I'm not even going to talk about China because that's a totally different conversation. Yeah. Okay, well, we'll start with Rosalie, maybe. Um, ge um, generally speaking, no. Um, I think sometimes, um, sometimes I have to think carefully about what's the best way to communicate uh, the work that I've done in order to get, in order to be heard by different constituencies. But I think um, I'm probably um, one of the people who sort of count themselves as a professional annoyer um, of policymakers and academics and conservationists more generally. So I tend not to tone down um, actually what I'm what I'm saying. Um. Yeah, firstly, totally agree with you. One of the biggest issues we face is corruption uh, of governments, collusion uh, and leniency. Um, and yeah, you don't have to you know, take much time to identify government officials that are involved. Um, but you know, do we ever dumb it down? No, do we ever hide it? Nope. Uh, are we always the ones that will be disseminating it? No. Often if, you know, in many situations, we gather the information on that connects to a certain individual and we'll share it with somebody else who's better a place to disseminate it, often somebody who's not based in the country where we work. Um, or we know good people in government who we can take that information to, who we trust, uh, who we believe will do something uh, correct with that information. 
Uh, thank you. I, I, that's an interesting, uh, you know, uh, perhaps question and also point. Uh, it, it, for, for my case, you know, as I mentioned, I was a part of the Wildlife Authority. Uh, so, and when I started working on illegal, perhaps hunting, uh, trade issues, you know, I, I think one thing that, that is important, and that time I was doing my PhD, so my supervisor told me that you don't have to be a wildlife manager, but you have to be a scientist. So that scientific independence is very, very important. And as long as, you know, you, the way you do your, your, your robust research, the methodologies are clear, you know, in many cases you don't need to, to hide anything. But I think, uh, you know, sci you know po policy makers or even the public may actually, you know, uh, then get, not get your data very well if you start to hide or even to manipulate the data. So I, I, I believe, uh, you know, it's important that the evidence you get has to be really, you know, uh, packaged very well, but not to hide anything, uh, but to really to show the pointers out to the policymakers. Yeah, I still want to say something. Actually, in, in China, when uh, when I started the work in 2006, um, the situation was not good like uh, currently. Yeah, so uh, because the illegal wildlife trade issue was very sensitive, uh, we traffic was ever uh, in the government blacklist. Yeah, so that means it was very difficult for us to del deliver the activities in China. But uh, but. Uh, um, we, we know what Chinese government, they like. They like the capacity building. So we, we do, you know, uh, readjust our work plan and uh, we uh, allocate some funding to uh, provide support to China's capacity building work. And uh, like during the enforcement <coughs> training, we pro uh, provide our, pro uh, we, we did the prevent, uh, presentation, which include our like IWT research. So then gradually, gradually, currently, so now more and more NGOs can deliver the uh, market monitor in China. It is not sensitive anymore. More questions? This one. Uh... Oh, we're getting more now. Great. <laughs> okay. So we've got one there. We'll take three this time. So we've got one there. We've got one right at the back, and we've got one at the front. So we'll just take three, and then we'll have a chat after that. Okay. Uh, Ross Harvey from South Africa. Uh, I have a question how you deal with your research results internally. So you can be independent and at an academic institution or working for, an, for a research NGO, but uh, how do you navigate internally how you present something? So to give you a concrete example, if you uh, are dependent on cooperation with the Department of Environmental Affairs for another piece of research that you're doing, uh, do you tone down your criticism for the sake of uh, ensuring that the other work doesn't get scuffed? Okay. Good question. So, one right at the back. Do you want to stand up? So, uh... uh, a comment in the one question, of course. Uh, my name is. cover this issue on that side before all the elephants or rhinos or tigers being killed 
<coughs> we believe that we could come with a, a better result. My question is what we've been doing in this way, extradition or to put, to take to court all those people committing crimes outside China. Thank you. Okay, and we've got one at the front here. Um, can the volunteers see if the aircon can go on? I don't know about you, lot, but it's, I'm quite hot. It's boiling here. <laughs> Thank you. Patrick from Fame from the Jane Goodall Institute Global. It was just mentioned that information and intelligence is extremely important uh, and that we could improve a lot more in sharing information, data collection, etc. Do you have any ideas about that, how to do that and to move ahead on that? Or are there probably best practices going on at this moment where we can learn from? Okay, so we had um, information sharing, uh, China Beyond Borders and self-censorship. Who wants to go first on one of those? Uh, thanks. Uh, I, I will go for uh, the information uh, sharing. Uh, I, I think was that that's something which uh, we always try to navigate. And, and I think you know here it becomes even uh, more you know interesting with, with these days with collaboration, especially if you are dealing with sensitive research. Uh, I, but what I still uh, you know I think and you know uh, advocate for is the issue that uh, you know science is to to be you know, credible. Uh, and in the times it, it's more about uh, perhaps uh, getting to the best people who, who actually appreciate the science. Uh, I know, it, especially if you want to look at uh, some departments uh, among many countries who would want perhaps permits, uh, renewal, or even to get uh, some approvals. But what's essential, I, I do believe, is that you present the science. Uh, but perhaps uh, one thing which may be uh, you know, critical is to, to reflect on how the policy, perhaps, or even the recommendations uh, you know, touch to, to the aspects that perhaps governments or even uh, the communities or any, any scientific uh, authorities would want to really take home message. Most of the times our science is not, uh, is, it can be actually you know, misunderstood and misinterpreted. But ideally, if we have a clear message uh, and a clear methodology that there is nothing that is you know, hidden, I believe you know, the, those results should really you know, stand out as they are and share the information. Perhaps one weakness, but I, I know if, just for Zimbabwe, if you are doing your research and, and you have a permit, you want to renew, they would need a report and even uh, to attach uh, all the evidence of research you have done. Uh, in that case, it, it's always essential that you know we don't hide you know aspects and perhaps also not uh, you know lose trust by sharing data you know without involving those uh, that would ever given their purpose. Anyone want to talk about any of the other two? Um, self censorship. I can. Yeah. yeah um, the, the question of self censorship. I, I would actually encourage researchers not to do that. Um, I think over the course of you know, 20 years of research, I haven't held back from saying things. And of course, that's meant that certain doors have closed to me. But I think that if I had self-censored in order to keep other kinds of partners happy or other internal or ministries happy, then over a 20-year period, I would, I would lack any legitimacy as, a, as an independent researcher. So I think that being self-censoring is actually a very short-term um, a, approach and that, we, that we, need, we need to be honest, if only because if we're not honest, then we might be giving information and advice that produces counterproductive or wrongly targeted um, interventions. And um, in, in terms of the kind of data and intelligence sharing, just kind of quickly, I think one of the things that concerns me greatly is the, um, the movement of, of NGOs into intelligence gathering, um, where there might not be that kind of experience of of data, um, of, of being able to hold data securely. Um, and I, would, I really am concerned about the way that some NGOs collect data and then don't think about what risks they put participants at. And they're sort of designing policies that are straight out of counterinsurgency handbooks without really understanding the, the, the dangers in that. So um, best practice, I think, is probably to hand it over to something like Europol or Interpol rather than deal, act on it themselves. Um, yeah, China. Um, China's law isn't um, applicable in other countries, except, uh, I mean, it's only um, 
effective for in China. So uh, this is why in the recent years, like China Customs, they, uh, they are looking forward to transboundering <coughs> collaboration with the other countries, uh, such as African countries, uh, the elephant ranger countries. Uh, as I know, uh, maybe in 2014, with support by Latif, um, and the China Customs, uh, they uh, seized the ivory smugglers in uh, Kenya, then take, uh, took them back to China, then published them under the China's law. So I, I don't think uh, China's law can be used in other country. <laughs> yeah. Um, and just to pick up on the information sharing point, I think everybody would agree it would be awesome to have some big giant database of everybody's NGOs all throwing it in there. And it's just um, for a, a multitude of reasons, I don't think we'll ever get to that. I think in terms of best practice, though, somewhere else in London right now, um, the Interpol group are speaking about the United for Wildlife Transport Sector Task Force, and tomorrow they're launching a financial sector task force. And those two task forces are private sector driven, and they're probably the only example I can think of where the NGOs have brought their data together. So a lot of the NGOs uh, that have been gathering information and intelligence, a lot of primarily open source to be honest, are then going through a central node of a single analyst that is not working for any of those NGOs, who then collates it, cleans it, structures it, and provides it to the private sector. And it's the only example of that that I can think of where all the NGOs are kind of bringing their data together. There's been a lot of projects, and no doubt this year there'll be another one, but none have had traction yet. But it's, uh, you know, it's something we should keep looking towards. Okay, so I want the next few questions to be asked by women. So women in the room, have a little think. <laughs> Stick your hands up. question which might be is this working yeah um, I worked for many years in Thailand uh, on, near the, the Myanmar border and I was very startled one time to be um, lamenting the treatment of a, of a, of a captive elephant and um, uh, in conversation with local and to be told you don't need to worry about that elephant it's a Burmese elephant <laughs> and I've had the same thing with people with migrants you know some poor poor group of people clearly mistreated probably borderline slaves, if not actual slaves. Uh, don't worry about them either, they're Burmese. And I just wonder if anyone has encountered that anywhere else with other species. In other words, also with the wild ones, if something is being brought in from Myanmar, there is apparently not quite the worry, as if it had been illegally captured in Thailand, because it wasn't a Thai species. I don't wish to malign Thailand here, because I, I don't know that it's a unique thing, and it might be a, just a local thing. But I just wondered if anyone else had encountered that, particularly with traffic, where you're talking cross-border. Is there, is there perhaps a, a, a less... I mean, in this particular case, it's tapping into a historical, socio-political <laughs> inheritance, which is a resentment of the Burmese sacking the Ayutthaya kingdom. And it, that's 300 years ago, and it hangs over into, um, into other areas. I think it's quite interesting, and it has repercussions. Any other questions in this batch? Yes, there's uh, Medard there. Medard in the middle. And anybody else after Medard? You don't have to be female. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Medard. I'm from Uganda. I work with Mbara University of Science and Technology. Um, I just want to get your view on two concepts. Um, as we engage policy. One of them is institutional efficacy, which um, to me is, is a very challenging aspect when it comes to uptaking most of the, of the evidences that we, we give up to the policymakers. And I would be more particularly interested in the institutional and legal frameworks within these institutions, but also at the same time the character of the uh, implementers within the institution. Because to me, that is very critical. If, for example, the characters of the implementers, the managers within the institutions, are not to the standard that we want these policies to be taken forward, then there's a very big problem. 
And we had a very big challenge in Uganda, in uh, Uganda Wildlife Authority, where uh, the characters of the people implementing uh, what should be acted on ended up betraying the whole process of policy implementation. And then the second concept is, is about the messages. What kind of messages uh, in terms of their simplicity, but also in terms of their complexity. Because most of us researchers have a tendency of having this message in a scientific form that is never understood by policymakers. And it becomes very hard to uptake most of our recommendations when they are too scientific and they are very hard to be interpreted. So if you could comment on those two, um, I would get light on that. Um, I'm Shakhe Mulukwani, People and Parks in South Africa. I just wanted to check if it is possible that uh, with this scientific research conducted, which I learn from the discussions here, sometimes they land on the, the tables of authorities and it is not acted upon. Is it not possible that in countries where there are organized structures like People and Parks in South Africa, they can be favored with those research because we'll be able to put pressure on our own government. Okay, so interesting set of questions there. So one about transboundary lack of interest in certain, certain species, one about simplicity of messages, institutional weaknesses, and new ways to get research into policy. So who'd like to start with that? Yeah, I would like to uh, talk about the message. Um, for, like, for our research, uh, when we have two uh, different uh, format when we uh, store our message. One is that like we have the uh, very um, how they we have the traffic format, yeah, to uh, put all the data uh, uh, trade data there. But uh, when we submit the uh, data to the enforcement agency, uh, that table doesn't work. Because, uh, as you know, it is maybe uh, too complicated for them to understand. So we have to produce a <laughs> word document, you know, with the detailed description and with the photo for everything in, in there to help them understand where the illegal wild of trade and how can they detect these uh, uh, products. So, so, yeah, different message. Okay. So I'm going to try and answer two questions with one answer. Um, because I agree with you, Belinda, there's, and I'm not going to mention countries' names because I don't, I don't think it's unique to any, any countries, but certainly some of the countries I work in in Southeast Asia, it's hard to think that they actually care for their own wildlife, let alone wildlife that's now been imported or transited through there from, from Africa or Latin America. Um, and I think that links to the messaging around that because if we're struggling to make arguments for why they should protect their own wildlife, making an argument based upon you know, a message of the, the impact of, you know, losing that species in another country on another continent that they've never been to and may never go to is, is very difficult. And so that's where messages uh, kind of need to be very unique for what is it that interests them. You know, for Africa, it might be it's more about trade or foreign relations or public image and so forth. But it's like really starting to think what is the right message for that audience? I mean, one thing I'd say is we all talk about behavior change and people will immediately go, behavior change, oh, it's demand reduction. But really, behavior change is relevant from the animals still being alive in the protected area and the people around there through the transit, through the retail, all the way to the consumers. And I think we need to stop restricting our idea of behavior change to be that's just about consumers because thinking about who you're targeting, what influences them, what their motivations are, and what is the right message is relevant, is relevant all the way through. Um, yeah, I mean, I, um, on, on the Myanmar thing, I, again, I'm, I'm, um, I don't want to uh, pick out particular countries, but I think there's, there, there is an issue there about why some animals seem to matter more than others and why some species seem to matter more than others and what animals we think of as, are more imp as, as important and why. You know, and if you look at you know, somewhere like Britain or the United Kingdom, um, you know, the public will jump up and down over elephants and rhinos, but they aren't jumping up and down over um, raptor eggs being um, traded out of Britain or raptors being traded out of Britain. You know, so it's not a problem that's unique to other parts of the world. It's a common issue and a common thing that we need to 
um, challenge. And I, I, I think you're absolutely right that I think, you know, sometimes we would be better off partnering with locally based on the ground NGOs who then can talk to structures of power in other countries. But again, I feel slightly uncomfortable with the idea that I have some sort of answer for another country uh, and another place. I can raise questions, I can come up with information, um, but perhaps sort of partnering with local partners is a, is a really productive way to go. Uh, thank you. I, I will tackle the uh, issues of uh, scientific uptake. I, I think w w what's very essential uh, at times is, is capacity building. Because at times you, we may have uh, you know, good research uh, being undertaken, but those that should be able to implement some of the recommendations uh, are not really perhaps understanding or appreciating some of the concepts. I think perhaps as uh, you know, NGOs or even uh, research institutions, it's very essential that we also extend uh, the capacity building uh, to some of the key you know, perhaps skill sets that we need to be uh, with those that are implementers. The issue of uh, you know, science communication is critical. Uh, we may be scientists, but I think they may be also necessary uh, to have frameworks uh, that you hope in terms of interpreting the, that complex you know, research you know, articles into more user-friendly you know, uh, notes. And then uh, the last part, uh, what happens when scientific evidence uh, perhaps is not uh, you know, recognized. Most of the perhaps departments or institutions dealing with uh, wildlife, you know, they have the research uh, as one of the critical elements. Uh, and at times, it's more about you know, following up even issues of adaptive management. Because how could you know, uh, institutions say they are into adaptive management frameworks when they have research, uh, in, in research that, you know, result that they are not uh, taking uh, into consideration? So I believe uh, in those annual, uh, research, you know, annual work plans or even planning processes, it's necessary that you know, there is evidence that you know, whatever is coming from the research is actually you know, put into the system so that the adaptive management framework actually works. Great. Okay. So um, now, as we're closing to a, drawing to a close, I'm going to ask each panelist to say one sentence about something that's really struck them. Uh, a short sentence about what struck them in the last 45 minutes. Start and fling. Um, um, a good research always uh, uh, takes time, um, but uh, has more chances to um, make evidence-based uh, policy uh, take place. Um, one thing we haven't talked about is the way policymakers and NGOs might take up policies that are not evidence-based because they're based on a good story. And the ivory terrorism narrative is a good example of that, where there's virtually no evidence for it, but it drives all sorts of funding, all sorts of initiatives, and all sorts of public interest. Um, um, that we should be working across disciplines. Uh, we need behavioural economists, we need criminologists, we need other people to help us with, uh, with the data that we need to gather. Uh, that we are dealing, particularly when we deal with illegal wildlife trade, with sensitive data, uh, which needs uh, really to be well uh, articulated uh, so that we don't lose some of the key uh, aspects of it. That was remarkably short, thank you. We're, we're now early. <laughs> we can do it again. <laughs> okay, so um, that was a really interesting set of questions and I'm sure you'll all agree that it was a really interesting and insightful set of panellists with, with uh, very useful perspectives. So can we just uh, put our hands together to thank them very much.